This is the second session of our April series about assessment and feedback. So I wanted to introduce you to our lineup of instructional strategists. My name is Kelsey Katina. Um, I am an instructional strategist with Wayside Publishing. I am in Chicago, Illinois, um, and I was a former Spanish teacher. Here with me tonight are my colleagues, um, Alexis and Carolyn. Lexi, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, my name is Alexis. I'm located in Oregon. I'm a former Spanish teacher, and now I'm also an instructional strategist. And we also have Carolyn, too. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Carolyn, and I'm based in Orlando, Florida, and I'm a longtime French teacher before joining these lovely ladies as an instructional strategist at Wayside, and we're so pleased to have you join us. And Carolyn is producing for us tonight. So as you have questions, she will be managing the chat. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in there and she will respond to them. So our game plan for tonight is to give you some highlights about tonight's session and our April series in general. And then we'll dive into our topics for the evening, which can be broken down into three sections. So we're gonna talk about how you can make the call on which rubric format to use and how you can use those rubrics effectively and how you can engage students by providing feedback through those rubrics. So quickly, I just wanted to share some information about our April series. Like I said, this is the second session of our series. Our next session, which is next week, is all about figuring out how to assign numeric grades to rubrics. So next Tuesday, you can join us same time, same place on Zoom. Um, and Carolyn has put a link in the chat to register for that session if it interests you. And again, we really are appreciative and any and all feedback that you provide to us on our sessions so that we can make improvements going forward. So if you can spare a couple of minutes um, after we log off today, please consider taking the survey um, that is in the chat that Carolyn just posted and it's also available via the QR code that's on my screen. A couple of other things to note is that we do have a workbook available for you to download and use. This is a great place to take notes and engage throughout the session. You can access it in the third link that Carolyn just posted in the chat, as well as through the QR, the QR code that's on my screen. So I'll give you a second to either open up that link or scan the QR code. And then from there, you can download the workbook which is completely fillable and typable. So you can type right on it to take notes and follow along as we talk about rubrics tonight. So I'll give you another second, a couple of seconds to get that workbook pulled up. Okay, and so really quickly, I just wanted to touch upon some of the top plays from last week. If you are unable to attend last week's session, you can catch the replay of it on our webpage, which Carolyn again just posted in the chat. But first, let me give you the highlights that we were all on the same page with where we're going tonight. So last week, Kate and Carolyn explained the different, explained the importance of choosing assessments that show what students can do in the target language and why both formative and summative assessments should be used to gauge progress. They also discussed the difference between proficiency-driven feedback and corrective feedback and provided some strategies and suggestions for providing proficiency-driven feedback. And really, it's that last point that brings us to tonight's focus on rubrics, because rubrics really are an evaluation tool that lend themselves very, very easily to providing proficiency-driven feedback for students. So now that we've caught up on last week's top plays, let's go ahead and get started with our content for tonight. So the quote that was selected for tonight is, don't let the fear of striking out get in your way. And really this quote is one that's been on my mind a lot lately. So Lexi and Carolyn, I don't know if you know this, but I have recently joined a kickball league in my neighborhood. It's been really, really fun but I have not played any form of kickball, softball, baseball, t-ball since I was in elementary school. 
And because of that, there's been a bit of a learning curve. I'm not kidding. I've been playing for a few weeks and I have yet to be able to make it on base. I keep kicking the ball really high in the air and being caught out immediately. So while it's been really fun to play and meet new people, it's also been really, really frustrating because I feel like I'm letting my team down and everyone else makes it seem so easy. However, at my most recent game, I was talking to my teammates and they actually gave me a bunch of different suggestions on how to improve my aim and kicking ability. And so last night while we were playing, after I had been caught out three times already, and even though I was really frustrated and worried that I had let my team down, I finally kicked a grounder to third base and I made it all the way to second. So I was very, very proud of myself. And so you might be wondering what exactly this all has to do with rubrics. Well, just like my experience with playing kickball on Tuesday nights, I struck out a lot when I was using rubrics in the classroom. I have used a variety of rubric types and formats, and I have struck out many, many times. From the format of the rubric that I used, to the domains that I included, to even the wording of the criteria on my rubric. It took some time to be able to make it on base regularly and eventually cross home plate with using rubrics, but each and every one of those strikeouts were really valuable moments that taught me how to use rubrics more effectively. So tonight, Carolyn, Lexi, and I are going to share with you some tips that we've learned about using rubrics effectively in the classroom. And so with all that being said, I just want to see where everyone is at on our metaphorical softball, baseball, or even kickball diamond. Feel free to post your answer in the chat or you can fill it in in the box on page three of your workbook, but I'd just like to know where are you at? Are you in the batter's box? So are using rubrics new to you? Have you tried them out a few times but you're struggling to see success with them? Have you made it on base where you do use them fairly frequently, but you're looking for some tips and strategies to help make your use of rubrics a little more effective? Are you crossing home plate? where you're comfortable using rubrics to assess and evaluate student work, go ahead and let us know in the chat where you're at. All right, I see some people on base. Some are in the batter's box. Crossing home plate and looking for some new ideas on base using actual rubrics. Awesome. Well, I really hope tonight's session provides you some useful tips and strategies on how to use these rubrics, uh, how to use your rubrics a little bit more effectively. So let's dive into talking about how to use rubrics more effectively. When deciding which rubric to use, whether you write your own or using a ready-made rubric like the ones found within Wayside Publishing's resources. Whether or not you choose to make your own or use ready-made rubrics, there are a couple things to keep in mind to help you get on base and score those home runs. First and foremost, consider the communicative task that students will do. Is the task going to be an interpretive task? Is it an interpersonal task? Or is it a presentational task? As Shrum and Gleason state, the rubric used for evaluation needs to fit the communicative purpose and should be developed based on the requirements of the communicative task. So I want to pause and take a moment to emphasize the communicative part of this quote. Like Kate and Carolyn discussed last week, you want to make sure that the task that you are assessing allows students to demonstrate what they can do with the language and not just assesses their ability to rotely recall information in a fill in the blank or a multiple choice activity. So again, really making sure that that task is communicative and that it works in one of the three modes of communication. And then once you've determined what type of task students will do, then consider the format of the feedback that you want to provide. Are you looking to just check off boxes? Do you want to write your students a message and have a conference with them at some point? Or do you want to focus on each individual area of their work? Or do you prefer to look at their work as a whole? So I want to give you some time to think about a performance-based task that you have planned or one that you would like to do with students. 
This could be a formative assessment. It could be a summative assessment. It could be a task that you've done for many years or one that you are trying out for the first time. So think about your task and have it in mind. And then I want you to consider these two questions. What type of task is it? And what type of feedback do you want to provide? You can record your answers on page three of your workbook or just think about them. But I'm gonna give you about a minute and a half or two minutes to think about this. And I just want you to think about it. There's no need to share out in the chat quite yet. Okay. So for me, I want my students to complete a presentational speaking task and I would like to conference with them about their responses. So I'll go ahead and give you a couple moments to think about your performance-based task and these two questions. Give you a couple more moments to consider your task and the type of feedback that you would like to provide. Okay, so now that you've had some time to think about a communicative task that you're planning to use um, in your classroom and that you've had a time to consider what type of feedback you want to provide, let's talk about the type of rubric that you decide to use. Because really your answers to these first two questions have a lot of an impact on the type of rubric that you decide to use. And something that was new to me when I first started using rubrics is that there are multiple types of rubrics to choose from. So we're going to touch base and talk a little bit about three different types of rubrics, starting with analytic growth rubrics. Here are two examples of analytic growth rubrics. When you look at an analytic growth rubric, you will notice that these types of rubrics are very, very detail oriented. They separate and score the pieces of an activity or a task individually to create a total rating. These rubrics really focus on the process behind the task and analytic growth rubrics really do allow students to see how they are progressing in multiple domains and aspects of a task or an activity. And while these rubrics can be a little bit more time consuming to write and use due to their detailed nature, they do provide a lot of very specific feedback for students at every step of the task. So analytic growth rubrics are one type of rubric to choose from. Another type of rubric would be a holistic rubric. So these types of rubrics are used when you want to assess students' work as a whole. They rate an activity in its entirety without regard to the separate pieces. So again, focusing more on the overall product as opposed to each individual process of creating that product. The criteria are often grouped together according to proficiency level, so you can use them to assess students based on where the majority of their evidence falls. These types of rubrics can be a little overwhelming to students sometimes because they don't break down that criteria into smaller pieces, However, they too provide ample opportunities to give that proficiency-driven feedback and are really a great tool for students to use to self-assess their own progress. 
And then the third type of rubric that I wanted to touch upon tonight are the single point rubric. So single point rubrics focus on the meets expectation or the on-target criteria. And a single point rubric is really helpful because it provides opportunities to point out areas of strength and areas in need of improvement relative to that on-target criteria. These rubrics may require a little bit more time to use due to the need to write individual comments for each one, but they do provide opportunities to provide very specific individual feedback to students, and they can serve as a basis for a conversation or a conference between you and the students. Now, I very, very quickly just glossed over these three types of rubrics. So if you want to learn a little bit more about each type of rubric, I recommend checking out Jennifer Gonzalez's post about the three different types of rubrics on the cult of pedagogy, um, which goes into a little bit more detail about analytic, holistic, and single point rubrics. And Carolyn has dropped a link to that blog post in the chat as well. So now that we've talked and recapped a little bit about the three types of rubrics, holistic, analytic growth, and single point. I want you to think back to that assessment that I had you reflect upon or think about. Based on the two questions that you answered earlier, what type of task will students do? And what type of feedback do you want to provide? Which rubric format would you choose? And would you elect to go with a analytic growth rubric? Would you prefer to use a holistic rubric or would you prefer to use a single point rubric? I'll give you a second to think and consider and then I invite you to share your responses in the chat. And I really wanna emphasize that there is no right or wrong answer here. It's all about what best suits your needs and fits the answers to your questions. Lexi's going with the single point rubric. I'm partial to single point rubrics. I like that individual feedback that looks at the advantages and disadvantages, the uh, advantages and the areas of improvement. Claude also is going with the single point rubric. Okay. Well, Regardless of which rubric type you have chosen, um, I want to provide you some quick tips that you can use as you make the call on what type of rubric to use. Because really choosing the right rubric for the task helps you to use your time more efficiently while evaluating your students' progress. And then as you're making the call on what type of rubric to use, just a couple of things to keep in mind and consider um, as you are either writing your own rubrics or you're looking at ready-made rubrics to use. First off, make sure that the language in your rubric is student-friendly. So make sure you're using I statements and try to avoid lengthy descriptions and metalinguistic terminology. Um, I also encourage you to incorporate ACTFL's performance descriptors into the criteria of your rubric to help you and your students differentiate between the benchmarks for each proficiency level. You also should aim to try to clarify any ambiguous terminology. Words like some, a lot, many, often, frequent are all terms that seem to make their way into rubrics. So when you use them, make sure that both you and your students really understand and grasp what these terms mean. But in doing that, try to avoid using numeric quantifiers like saying I use five to seven transition words in my response, because when those types of quantifiers are included, they draw students' attention away from the communicative task and pulls it towards just checking off requirements on a list. Okay. And so at this point, we've come to our seventh inning stretch. So in sticking with our baseball theme, we're gonna give our brains a little bit of a break from focusing on rubrics before Lexi takes over to talk about our next section. And we just have four real quick baseball softball trivia questions for you. So you can respond to the question by just simply entering the letter in the chat. 
Um, so our first question, we'll see if anyone knows which team won the World Series in 2021. Any ideas? That's okay. Oh, we've got a guess for the Dodgers. The correct answer is A, the Atlanta Braves. And I think it was one of, well, maybe don't quote me on this, but I think it was a very big win um, historically for the Atlanta Braves. Okay. Now the 2020 Olympics happened over the summer. Does anyone know which team won the gold medal for softball? in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. Your options are A, Canada, B, the US, C, Japan, or D, Mexico. See some guesses for Canada. The winning team, the gold medal team for the 2020 Olympics was Japan this year. Next question, does anyone have any idea of how many teams are in the MLB? Your options are A, 50, B, 40, C, 30, or D, 20. Some guesses for 20. There are actually C, 30 teams in the MLB, 15 in the American League and 15 in the National. And our last trivia question is what is the fastest recorded pitch in professional softball? Is it A, 75 miles per hour, B, 73 miles per hour, C, 81 miles per hour, or D, 77 miles per hour? All right. You see a lot of Cs for 81 miles per hour. The correct answer is actually D, 77 miles per hour. Um, and it was pitched by Monica Abbott in 2012. So with that being said, thank you for taking a little bit of a brain break with me. And I'm going to hand things over to Lexi as she talks a little bit more about how to use rubrics effectively. All right. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, 77 miles an hour on that fast pitch softball. And remember, softball pitchers are much closer than baseball pitchers. So less time to think about that pitch as it's coming at you. All right, so hopefully that gave your brain a nice little rest and maybe you even learned something about baseball, baseball or softball that you didn't know before. But now we are going to dive back into using rubrics with our assessments. So detailed rubrics like that complete analytic growth rubric that Kelsey showed us cover many different domains and criteria but they can also be overwhelming to both teachers and students. It can also take a lot of time for a teacher to compare the student work against several different domains, and it can be difficult to provide effective and timely feedback with such a detailed rubric. So what can we do about that? <laughs> In softball, if the pitcher is really fast, like Kelsey just said with that 77 mile an hour fastball, the batter can choke up on the bat a little bit, and that helps their bat get across the plate more quickly so they can adjust to that quick pitch. In a similar way, we can shorten up our rubrics to make them more manageable and effective for us and our students. By using a more succinct rubric, we can focus on the most important and relevant domains for our students and save ourselves as teachers time and energy in the process. We also want to make sure that we can that we are providing the correct type of feedback for students. First of all, our rubric needs to match our assessment type. So ask yourself if the rubric that you want to use is really the best rubric for that particular task that students will be completing. Secondly, it's important to choose the correct rubric to align with the type of feedback that you want to provide. So if we want to provide proficiency driven feedback for our students, we need to focus on the domains that would achieve that goal. Teachers never have enough time to get anything to get everything done. We all know that. But by narrowing our focus with our rubrics and choosing appropriate and timely feedback, we can save ourselves some of that precious time. So for example, if I have 150 student assessments to compare against a rubric, 
I would much rather look at a rubric with one to two domains rather than a rubric with seven domains. And if I'm gonna take the time to write comments for my students, I would rather spend time writing a quick comment that gives students a goal or something tangible to work towards rather than a series of corrective feedback marks that they might not even look at. So how can we pare down our rubric so that it's more manageable? I'm gonna walk you through an example of how you can take a formative assessment and use it with one of these pre-made rubrics in a way that's manageable and uses the most of our time while still providing solid feedback. We're gonna go back to this uh, analytic growth rubric. So this particular rubric that you're seeing is for a Spanish two interpersonal task. This could be used to assess one of the formative assessments that's found throughout Entre Culturas or Entre Cultures. And notice how many domains there are. Here we have six domains and descriptors for four levels of proficiency. That is a lot for one task. So I'm gonna cut this down and make it easy to use for myself and for my students. So I'm going to be referencing documents that come from our Entre Culturas series that are found within the learning site. So if you don't have access to those right now and you're interested in previewing these documents, you can actually request digital access to our materials. And Carolyn just put that in the chat. You can go to that link and fill out the form to request a sample. And then you're able to look through and see some of what we offer. So this is an example of, our, of a formative assessment from Entre Culturas Dos. And this one is a, an interpersonal writing task. Students are going to read an email from Enrique where he's talking about his school in Ecuador. And then Enrique is asking our students some questions about what he can expect from schools in the United States. Students are going to answer his questions about their own school. So questions about how big the school is, how long their classes are, what their teachers are like, um, different details about their school in the United States. And so students will write that as an email to respond to Enrique and this will be their interpersonal formative assessment that they're going to turn in. So keeping that formative assessment and the tasks in mind, I'm going to look at the rubric domains from the analytic growth rubric that we saw earlier. So on the right here, you can see what the students are gonna do in that task. And on the left, you can see the six domains from that rubric. And six domains is a lot for that one formative assessment. I really want to pare this down and focus on what's most meaningful for me and my students. So now it's your turn. I'm going to give you a moment. Look at the assessment on the right. What are students going to be doing? And then the criteria or the domains on the left. And I want you to pick one or two domains that you would focus on for this assessment. So you can put the numbers in the chat. Like, would you focus on number two? Would you focus on four and six? What do you think are the most important? So put those numbers in the chat or you can circle them in your workbook as well. They're on page four in that workbook. Okay, so we've got two and six, vocab and context and interculturality. Those are two great domains. Four and five, comprehensibility, comprehension, two very important things that go hand in hand, yes. Two and three, vocab and function and text set. One and four. Quality of interaction, comprehensibility, great. There's no wrong answer here. It really depends on what you and your students have been doing in your classroom and what's really the most important for you as well. Um, so if you wanna learn more about domains and criteria, Carolyn is going to put a link from ACTFL into the chat where you can go find more general information about these things. But for this particular activity, we are going to rely on our analytic growth rubric um, from Wayside. Okay. So uh, for me and my students, I am going to choose to focus on the domain of how do I use language, function, and text type. So that's the one that I am choosing for this particular assessment. So now that I have my rubric narrowed down to one domain, it's much easier for me to envision how I'm going to use this rubric with this formative assessment. 
I can compare the student writing to the different criteria in one domain and then select a proficiency level that's best reflected by that student work. And you can see there's four proficiency levels up there at the top. So I can leave it like this, or I can narrow it down even further. So for this particular task, at this point in the year with my Spanish two, I'm gonna say that novice high is our goal for this task. So now I have narrowed it down to not only the domain, but also the criteria that's leaving me one box that I'm really looking at for this particular assessment. From here, I can use this description to create a single point rubric. So let's see what that looks like. This is an example of a single point rubric that's derived from that analytic growth rubric. And you can see how much more condensed this is. So instead of having 24 boxes with text in a table, I now have one box with text. And I need to decide whether the language accurately describes the targeted goal I want students to reach. By looking at the text here, is it clear to me how I will evaluate the student work? If not, what can I tweak in the description to make it more user-friendly? And very importantly, is the language clear for students? Do my students know the difference between simple sentences and phrases? Do they know what original sentences means? And if not, I either need to teach those up front so students know what to expect, or I can change the language in this description so that it's more student friendly. This type of rubric allows me to quickly and efficiently leave individualized feedback for that particular student. I can decide whether or not that they've met that criteria that's listed, and I can include comments specific to that student work about where they exceeded or where and how they can improve further. I want my students to see this rubric a few times before and during the assessment as well. They should be as familiar with this rubric as they are with the assessment task. So now that I've created this rubric, how do I know that it's appropriate for my assessment? So one thing that I can do is test out my new rubric by comparing it to examples of previous student work. So if I have some work laying around from the last few years where they've done this assignment or a similar assignment, I can pull those examples out and compare them to the rubric that I created to make sure that rubric is appropriate. Part of coaching, whether it's in education or in any other aspect of life, is to set expectations by showing good examples to our players or our students. By showing previous student work that met your expectations, students have a goal, a context, a frame of reference for what they're about to do. So what, what can you do if you don't have any examples of previous student work? So one thing um, that you can do is create your own example for students, but remember your proficiency level versus their proficiency level. So create something that looks like a piece of student work. Another thing that I like to do was ask one of my former students to write something for me to use it as an example in this case. Oftentimes I had former students who had already taken my class come back as a teacher assistant. And so they were hanging out in my room there to support me anyways. And I could give them that task to do a few days ahead of time and they could write something up for me. Another great place to look for help is if you have exchange students in your school. We always had Spanish speaking exchange students and oftentimes they were given to me as a TA as well. And so they were a great source um, to write that student example, especially if I had given them a lot of student work to look at previously, or if they participated in my class a lot, they knew what my students could do. And they could also oftentimes mimic that um, proficiency level for my class in the examples they made for me. So those are some fun ways to get some examples to use in your classroom. So when you present the, the assessment assignment task to your students, consider showing them the rubric for the assignment and some of those completed examples of the assessment. And you could even have them grade previous assignments for you if you really wanna have a solid foundation for them on those expectations. So all of this brings up our final section of tonight's session, getting your students involved in the assessment process. If we're gonna use rubrics with our students, it's important to teach them how to interpret rubrics and apply them to their learning. When they're able to do this, it helps, them, it helps put them in control of their own learning. At a base level, students need to see that big picture of the task and see how it's assessed. And from there, they need to understand how the rubric addresses specific components of that task. 
To recap, here are some tips to teach students how to make the most from rubrics in your classroom. First of all, students need to understand the various types of rubrics that you're using and the purpose for them, but be sure to use student-friendly language and examples. Secondly, think about what the rubric is saying. If the terms reflect a lot of technical jargon, students likely will not have a solid understanding of what's being described to them. One way to make rubrics student-friendly and to help students develop a better understanding and awareness of the criteria against which they're being evaluated is to develop common vocabulary for the domains and descriptors with students. You could even invite students to help you create some of the language in those rubrics so that it's clear to them and to you as well. In addition, include, your lessons, include in your lessons some repeated practice sessions on how to use rubrics with students. Share anchor examples of students' performance along each point of the continuum so they have a clear picture of what performance looks like. Another simple practice is to create a, and use a simple, generic, single-point rubric for interpersonal practice during class as well. Just like in sports, when we're working with rubrics, practice makes progress. Rubrics become easier and more effective the more often you use them and your students use them as well. Tonight, we've covered a few topics about rubrics. Whether you're, you've learned about making the call on which rubrics to make, narrowing your focus around rubrics, or how to engage students in the process of using rubrics, we hope that some of our tips will help you knock it out of the park the next time you go to use a rubric. If you look at page five in the workbook tonight, we've included an activity to help summarize some of your thoughts and takeaways from our time together tonight. And remember that a recording of this session will be available on our PD website so that you're able to rewatch this again later if you need to. Again, we really appreciate your feedback on tonight's session so that we can make improvements going forward. If you could spare a couple of minutes, please consider taking the survey accessible from the QR code here or in the tiny URL. And we'll put that in the chat again. Actually, Carolyn already did. And we hope that you'll join us next week for the last session of our April series. And you can register at the link in the chat and on the slide. And also stay tuned at the same link for more information coming up about our really fun and exciting session that we're planning for May. Here's a few resources that we used tonight in our presentation. These are also in the workbook as well. And you can also request a certificate of participation for today's webinar. You can click on the link in the chat or scan the QR code to reach uh, the form to create this certificate. And again, we just wanna thank you so much for spending your evening with us. We hope you have a great evening. If you have any questions, We'll be here for another minute or so, and please feel free to reach out to any of us. Thanks so much for being with us, folks. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I was wondering if I could ask a question. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, so I use Entre Futur, I teach French, and the rubrics are very helpful with, um, you know, it aligns nicely with the actual proficiency standards with, you know, novice low, novice high, et cetera. But I find that the students progress so slowly from one level to the next, you know, like it's over a whole year, right, that they might make progress from novice high to intermediate low <clears throat> or something like that. I was wondering um, if you or anyone here you know, does something a little more granular, in, you know, in that regard so that students can feel that they're making progress or see where they're making progress, um, that it's not like, oh, here I am, intermediate, you know, novice high again for the third month in a row. Um, you know, um, obviously they're doing it in a bunch of different topics, right? So like you've achieved mm -hmm. that level and then the next topic, the next level, you know, like they, they can see that they achieve, you know, novice high in a variety of of um, different topics that they didn't know before, but um, just any any suggestions or any you know thoughts you have on on that um, of student you know more granular student progress I guess in the in the short term. 
Well, I think a couple things come to mind. One is to really share with the students that actual visual of the proficiency, that kind of inverted pyramid. So yeah. they can see how, you know, as you progress up, there's so much there's so much more that you're, you know, focusing on with the language and that it takes time, you know, and for them not to be discouraged by what they can't do, but just to focus on what they are able to do. And I think, you know, it's nice to have them look at, um, you know, like, let's say they're at the novice mid level, you know, take, I would take time to celebrate with them what they can now do as a novice mid that they couldn't do as a novice low. Um, and then, you know, with that too, there's the, the um, rubrics that we have um, that, that allow students to kind of really focus in on what they're able to accomplish. And it's sort of the tracking document that you find in the teacher's resources folder. If, if you look at that, that might be nice for each student to have one of those, just to have on pencil and paper, a do, you know, documentation of how much they've come along and what they can now do. Um, and then I think too, tapping into the portfolio mm -hmm. is another great way for students to, you know, celebrate their, their, what they, you know, their growth essentially, both in not only language, but in interculturality too, how much they're learning about the Francophone world and, you know, how much that's impacted the way that they see the world, their own culture and their own values and beliefs. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I um, I do, I do really like to have them have a, you know, a portfolio at the end and, mm -hmm. and, and have them show, you know, like a, a starting, a mid and an end and then, and then let them go back and redo, you know, one that they've, a sample that they've done and show how much mm -hmm. they have learned and they've, and they've done that. So that works really well for like the long term, but yeah, mm -hmm. in the short term, I think you're right, just focusing and, and maybe that's it, having them put in their own words, you know, what, mm -hmm. what progress they've, they've seen to look for that. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for tonight. You're so welcome. We're glad you're with us. <laughs> and you know, too, we we really do enjoy, um, you know, connecting with our French teachers. And I don't know if you're on our Facebook page, but um, you know, you're on on your wayside. Um, you know, we post tips and tricks and strategies. So that might be another way to stay connected with other, you know, other people who use the resources. Right. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Have a wonderful night, guys. You too.